It's good to be in God's house. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, your pastor has a cold. So if you don't see me hugging you and giving you a kiss, it's because I don't want you to get this thing that I've got. I've got a little slight fever. But I'm here. Amen. Amen. And we're here to worship and praise the Lord and hear a word from God. Amen. Amen. But before we do, I just want to share with you some things that have happened at that conference. <clears throat> Your pastor was here when... One day, and I ended up calling. This was before the conference came. And uh, I want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you, Brother Sajiv and Sister Linda up in Maine, and uh, all those who may be in tuning in uh, from time to time. God bless you. And uh, I was here, and I felt to call Pastor Grosvenor and talk with him and just share with him some things. And uh, I did, and he said to me, he said, Pastor, would you please pray for me? He says, I'm having a hard time finding a theme for this conference. He says, I've come up with several ideas in prayer, but it doesn't seem to be what the Lord wants. And, he, and immediately the Lord dropped into my spirit for such a time as this. And so I told him, I said, Pastor, I says, I think I've got the theme for you. He said, what is it? I said, for such a time as this. And he said, ooh, that just resonated in my spirit. He said, I'll pray about that. Well, he ended up praying and he implemented that theme. For such a time as this, and uh, how true that was uh, with all of the uh, messages that came, and Brother Kemp Holden, Holden uh, did an excellent job in, in sharing the word, and all of us had a chance during the day to share uh, the word, and, and so we're thankful for what God did. But I met several of the missionaries there. How many were there, by the way? Do you remember 19, 17? 17 different countries represented. And uh, I got to meet some of them, and... and uh, there was about four, I think, four or five from India. And so when they heard that I was going in September, they said, we want you to come while you're here. So I'm, I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, we're going to see how that works out. There's one that's right in Bangalore, Bangalore where I'll be going, so that one won't be t too difficult. But the other one is going to be up north uh, into almost the area of Nepal. And uh, there's a high, extreme Muslim uh, situation there. So we have to be careful. So, uh, and then there's another brother uh, that wanted me to come, an older gentleman that's been in ministry for 38 years there in India. He's from India, has several hundred churches under him, and he asked if I would come and speak. So please keep that in your prayers. Uh, and uh, we also got an invitation to Croatia. And... Uh, so we're going to be praying about that, and also an, an invitation for the ladies. I don't think I'll be going, but uh, I, it could change my mind, but for the ladies to go to Greece. And uh, that would be an excellent trip, mission trip for you to go and work with uh, Gail Strathis. Uh, she has e EME, I think, ministries there, and uh, I think it will be a blessing. Uh, they take in over 3,000 refugees from Syria, Damascus and that area every single day. They said that the country is bankrupt. People are without jobs. Uh, it's very difficult to keep the church going, but they are. God's been faithful. So keep them in your prayers. Amen? Praise God. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, and <clears throat> keep me in your prayer also while I'm preaching here, um, open up to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8. I want to share this theme with you this morning, a people, a land, and a promise. A people, a land, and a promise. And we're going to look in chapter 8 of Deuteronomy this morning, and I just want to say if uh, they're watching, thank you to Pastor Jerome for filling in for me on Sunday morning. Did he do a good job? Amen. Praise the Lord. Good. And also for Pastor Manny Arujo on Wednesday evening. Uh, good, faithful men that I can depend on to uh, share the word while I'm gone. Amen. I was reading this scripture this morning. It was about midnight. And <clears throat> uh, because of this cold and Linda, Linda doing what she's doing now, it's very difficult to sleep. So I got up and I went around midnight. I went downstairs and just 
sat for about an hour and I was contemplating and saying, okay, Lord, what do you, what's on your heart? What's, what's, what's your message for your people today? And this one scripture came to my heart and mind and, and so I, I researched it out and, and fell upon it and I said, well, this would be a good thing to talk about this morning. So if you have your Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 15. Let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is always true. Your word is always faithful because you are faithful. And you're not a man that you should lie. So your word is true. And whatever you've spoken, whatever you have decreed, it will come to pass. So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you for your land. And thank you for your promise that you have given not only to the Israelites, but to those who are in in Christ Jesus. And we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read this scripture here, verse 15. Who led thee through that great and terrible or frightening wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock of the flint. I want you to know that when God leads you, it's not always mountaintop experiences. When you go through life, when you go through situations, a lot of times we try to rationalize and figure out, well, maybe I'm not in the place that God has for me. And therefore, we make emotional decisions when it, things get tough and things get rough. But God, if you read this scripture, says that he was the one that led them through that great and terrible wilderness. God's Holy Spirit led them to a place that was not comfortable, to a place where there was trials and tribulations and terror, if you will, to a place that was terrible with the conditions and the circumstances and the situations. Now, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, they that are led by the children of God, that they are the sons of God or daughters of God. And sometimes the Holy Spirit is going to lead you into situations that you just don't understand. Here these people were going on a journey from bondage to the promised land. So I want you to understand that in order to obtain the promises of God, sometimes you're going to have to go to and go through some uncomfortable situations. I know there were times when I worked at Titleist that there were some uncomfortable situations there. There were people that would laugh and mock at my walk with God, and there were those that would ridicule. And there was often many times that I talked over with Linda and said, I think maybe I should leave. Maybe this is the time to leave. And God said, no, this is not the time to leave. Just stay on, stick it out, go through it, put up with it. Hallelujah. And so wanting to do God's will, I did. And because I did, now we have Rebecca with us and her family. We have Milan and her family and others. Because even in the trials, even in the times that are terrible, when we think that we can't handle anymore and we want to run from those things, God says, stay where you are, stick it out. I've got something better for you. And see, the, the thing is, is that these Israelites 
when they went through these great things, there was often times that they became discouraged. What was the thing that caused them discouragement? The thing that caused them discouragement was God's promises weren't coming fast enough. They were impatient. But God was doing something in them. He was providing something in them that would cause them to depend upon him. So let's look at verse 1 in uh, 1 to 3 if we can. It says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall you observe to do, that you may live and multiply. I want you to see the blessing here. The, the blessing is that if you will live according to his commandments, you will multiply and you'll be blessed. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. And you may go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. The Bible says that through much tribulation, you will enter the kingdom. Doesn't it say that? But well, why is it that we're always trying to shun tribulation? We want it easy. We want it to be more conducive to our lifestyle of what we want. But God says, no, I've chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. He was telling that to the Israelites. Sometimes God will speak to us, and we're so busy with our minds focused on certain things that we can't hear him. God says, no, I will not have that. So listen to this. Look what he says. He says, and thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led, these, led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. It was 40 years that they were in the wilderness. 40 is the number of probation. Do you understand that you're only on probation down here on earth? Hallelujah. But when this life is over, God's got a mansion waiting for us in glory. Hallelujah. He does. When we go through the waters and we go through the floods and we go through the fire, God is with us to sustain us and to keep us in and during those tough times that we face. Oh, it's wonderful if we can have everything smooth and everything be happy and joyous and Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. But your attitude can be the same. You can still be joyous in time of trouble. You can still be happy when you're going through the tough times. Look what he says here. You shall remember all the way which the Lord thy God led these, led thee these 40 years, <clears throat> excuse me, in the wilderness for a purpose. What was the purpose? To humble thee. To humble thee. To humble thee. Why would they have to be humbled? Is the question. We'll talk about that. He says to humble thee and to prove thee. To know what was in thy heart. Whether thou was would us keep his commandments or no? So God led them in the wilderness, in the terrible times, in the place where there was no water. Then we have the question people that are always asking questions of God all the time. How come this? How come that? Why no water? Why no this? You're not supplying my need. Blah, blah, blah. And on and on and on they go. Well, that's exactly the attitude that got them in the desert for 40 years in the first place. They were mumbling and grumbling and complaining to God, and God said, okay, well, what I got to do is put you out in the wilderness. It was only a matter of 80-something or 100-something miles that they had to travel. But what happened was they kept going around and around and around and around and around because they were moaning and groaning and complaining. And so what happened was God had to wait till that generation died off. Remember when 
uh, Joshua and Caleb and the, the other spies went out to spy the promised land. And they all came back and, you know, ten of them said, no, we can't do it. It's impossible. There's giants in the land. They always were looking in the natural, looking in the natural, looking in the natural, discerning in the natural, rationalizing in the natural. There were two men, Joshua and Caleb. And they discerned in the promises and in the spirit of God and what God spoke to Moses. He says, I've come and I've given you a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And that's the land that you're going to go and you're going to possess it. And they, tr they trusted God and they believed God's word. And they stood on God's word and said, no, Moses, we can go in and we can take the land because we're not fighting just for ourselves. God is on our side. It says, and he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. Uh-oh. What? Yes, he suffered them to hunger. And he fed them, and then he also fed them with manna. He said, which thou knowest not, neither did thy father know that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. By the mouth of the Lord doth man live. He said, Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man uh, chasteneth his son, so the Lord God chasteneth thee. If we could sum it up in one word, what was Israelite, the Israelites' problem? Ungratefulness, but it's the opposite of what God was looking, had to bring them to. He had to humble them because they were proud. They were a proud people. Look what it says here. And therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land. Hallelujah. Verse 7. A good land. Didn't seem good at the beginning, did it? There's a lot of trials and tribulations and persecution and, and uh, hunger and thirst and terror and terrible things. For the Lord bringeth thee into a good land, a land of, of brooks, of water, of fountains and depths that spring out of the valleys and the hills. So the times that they went through a dry period where there was no water, and how many know you need water to survive? The very life depended upon water. They didn't say to the Lord, Lord, my life is in your hands. And God did provide water. It came out of the rock, the flint. He says, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land full of oil, a land of oil, olive, and honey, a land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Look at this. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills thou mayest dig brass. When thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Before God will bless, there's also a time of testing. Before there's a time of blessing, there's a time of testing. See, we can't see the end results. And when we keep our eyes focused only on the natural, we lose perspective of what God has said.
He says this. When thou hast eaten and thou full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for good land which he hath given thee. But verse 11 says, but beware. Everyone say the word beware. beware. That thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes in which I command thee this day. Why would he say that at that point? Because when people begin to get blessed, they have a tendency to forget God. When they have all of their needs met, and they're self-sufficient, they forget God. They get so caught up in everything and anything that they have that God takes second place. Hello? Hello? Think about it. When you were in need, you prayed. You humbled yourself. But now that it's flowing with milk and honey, you don't pray as much anymore. You don't read God's word as much anymore. You don't desire the things of God that much anymore. Because these things were the exact thing that the stumbling block of the Jews was their wealth. Solomon, as wealthy as he was, the wealthiest man in the world, supposedly the smartest or the one that had the most wisdom in the world, except for Jesus, went against God, backslid, married uh, foreign women with foreign gods and built, uh, built foreign uh, temples, that he's supposed to be the wisest man that ever lived. So let me say this to you. Don't think you're so wise to say, well, God can bless me and I'll, still, I'll be okay. If the wisest man that ever lived fell, be careful lest you fall also. Hello? But God wants to bless us, but he doesn't want the blessings to become our God. Hello? Lest thou, when thou hast eaten and thou full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Remember, hear me now, remember from where you went. Remember where you were. Remember how you lived. Remember your circumstances and situations while you were in bondage. When you were away from the Lord, remember where you were. Remember how you were. Remember what you did. God has a land for us as Christians. It's glory land. We don't have a physical land like the Israelites had the, in Canaan. But we have a spiritual Canaan. We have a spiritual land where God says the foundation and the builder is God. We have a mansion in glory. We have a place in the heavenlies seated with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate land, to be in heaven with him forever and ever. To be in his peace and in his warmth and in his grace forever. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more cancer, no more tumors, 
No more sickness. No more disease. No more financial difficulties. No more uneasiness. To be with the Prince of Peace forever and ever and ever. He said, Then shall thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Remember the bondage you were in? Remember how everything was so disarrayed in your life? Everything was falling apart? And then at that one moment where it was a situation in your life, you met someone. I remember Linda and I meeting Vicki years before she got saved. She took care of this woman that we knew who was a Christian, Sister Miller. We met her. We talked to her, I think, about Jesus maybe once or twice, and she said, well, I'm Catholic. <clears throat> and now she's the crusader against Roman Catholicism and tells everybody that she knows that's stuck in that religion. And I don't blame the people of the Catholic Church. I blame the, lady, the leadership for lying to the people. I don't have a pope. I have a savior. Amen. I don't go through anybody else. The Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. I don't need to go to anyone else. When you were in bondage, People that go to church because they have to are in bondage. People that come to church because they want to are free. They love the Lord. They want to be here. They want to be at the services. You don't have to drag them, kick them, beat them, drag them. They'll come on their own. They love the presence of God. They love God's people. They want to be around God's people because where there's light expels darkness. From the house of bondage. But do you know these Israelites still complained? How many times have you read in the Old Testament in the, in the five books of Moses? The Israelites always said to Moses, Word to God that we were to die out here in this wilderness. It'd be better for us to go back to Egypt. Think about that. It's better for us to go back into bondage. Can you imagine being that desperate? And saying to God, it's better that we go back to Egypt. <clears throat> I remember Debbie often say to me, I can't go back. There's nothing there for me. I know who I was. And I know who I am. And there's no turning back. She knows it would be miserable. As the Bible says, like a dog returning to its vomit. But see, the people of Israel were so much in despair. They said, it's better that we go back to Egypt into bondage. Think about it. Would you want to go back to your whole life? Would you want to go back to the way things were? Where you were lost as a goose? Tired and worn. And no peace. Life falling apart. Where would you be? if it was not for the hand of Almighty God today? Where would you be, Jeanette? Where would you be, Joe?
Many people commit suicide because they just can't take it. Many turn to drugs or alcohol, which leads to a depraved life, alone, secluded, dirty, hungry. But look at verse 15 again. Who led the, say the next word with me. Who led the, who led the, again. He didn't keep them there. And you've got to remember that. That no matter what you go through, he's not going to keep you there. He's going to lead you through. See, we can miss one word in the scripture and miss it. But he said, I'm going to lead you that great and terrible wilderness. So now, what does that cause you to have? Yes, it causes you to have hope. God said he's going to lead us through that great, terrible wilderness. So I have hope. Now it's going to take a little bit of Patience to see what God will do. Amen? Amen. When he said, I'll lead you through that great, terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents. Those, that word fiery in the Hebrew means poisonous. So what does that say to us? That when we go through this valley and we go through this time of, of wilderness experience, there may be some things that are going to be dangerous. See, like many, many uh, American missionaries won't go into Nepal. They won't go to certain parts of the world because they're afraid. But what if God wants you to go? The Apostle Paul says, if I perish, I perish. My time and seasons are in God's hands. And if you die on the mission field, what greater honor is that to serve the Lord? Okay, now raise your hand if you want to come with pastor to Nepal. <laughs> I got two, two, three. Very reserved, though, but. <laughs> Only two? He said, there's going to be some fiery serpents, and there's going to be some scorpions. You ever see those scorpions? They sting with their tail. And not only that, drought where there's no water. Can I tell you, the greatest drought is not just the physical drinking of water. It's spiritually. You know how many Christians are in spiritual drought right now? They're dry. They're dead. They're thirsty. And they don't know how to drink the water. But Jesus said, come unto me, all who are thirsty. And I'll give you rest. If you're hungry and thirsty, he'll fill you. But when you're going through the dry place and you're going through a physical time and then you're going through a spiritual time, it can be very, very depressing. So how do you get out of it? That's why you've got to have God's word in you, not just carrying it in, with you. 
You better have God's word in you who led thee through. That's how you get through. To know that God will lead you through that thing. So when you're in it, you don't become despaired. I remember when I was in India the first time. I left, I left here with a fever, and a, I was sick. It was in March. It was just about turning summertime. It was a little bit rainy season in summertime there. Very hot, 100 degrees every day. A fever, 99 to 100 every day. Dysentery every day. Going on a motorcycle at times, going in a crowded car to these remote villages to preach the gospel, to preach and teach the pastors. Go through all of that to go back to the hotel just to collapse and just rest. And in those six weeks, lost 65 pounds. Hello. And I'm thin as it is. My wife said when I got off the bus, she didn't even recognize me. And then went home, collapsed, and had to go to the hospital to get some um, uh, IV. And I remember when I was getting on the plane, they wouldn't let me on, and they had to ask me not to travel. The doctor of the airport said, I advise you not to travel. And I was so sick in that wheelchair going, they wheeled me into the aircraft with that, uh, to the, 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 the steps of the aircraft. Because <clears throat> they did finally let me go. And I convinced them to let me go. And I was so sick. But I remember God giving me a word. This is why it's on. This is my point to you this morning. He'll lead you through. And even though the enemy spoke to me and said he's going to kill me at that time, I said, You're not going to kill me because God gave me a promise in Genesis. He said, I will bring you back to this land again, meaning America. And he wasn't going to bring me back in a, in a black coffin. He was going to bring me back home. And I remember coming home, getting on that plane and you have to understand, that's 22 hours of travel. In a plane, and you know how, how the seats are. 22 hours of travel, five-hour layovers, four or five-hour layovers. And then finally landing in, uh, in Boston, taking the bus from Boston to New Bedford. Uh, no, it was Providence. That's where you picked me up, it was in Providence, I But through all of that, through all of that, God got the glory. Through all the suffering and all the pain. And I remember getting onto that plane and, and I was in that wheelchair and I was so sick. You have to understand. For most of the six weeks I was there, I would say except for one week, there's dysentery every day. Hardly eating the food because it was so hot. Temperature, I mean, uh, spice-wise. And I asked the Lord in tears. I was on, the, I still remember this. In that wheelchair, I said, God, why am I suffering so much in this place? And I'll never forget the words he told me. He said, son, all for the sake of the gospel. You are going to suffer at times. You're going to suffer sometimes when God says no. How, how many know that God says no? Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says no. See, what God's saying in this passage of Scripture to the Israelites, I've got a promised land for you. I've got something great for you. That's going to be flowing with milk and honey. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. Your silver and your gold's going to multiply. I've got nothing but blessing for you. But obey my commandments. To obey is better than sacrifice. There's blessing in obedience, and there's 
curses and disobedience. And it's up to you to choose. Is this helping anyone? Yes. Who brought forth who brought thee forth water out of the rock of Flint? Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you've seen water flowing out of a rock? Now catch this. Catch this. Catch this. It's not natural. Is it? When you find yourself in a position where there is impossible situations, God can supernaturally provide for you. Think about it. Here's these people wandering around in the wilderness, right? Here they are wandering around in the wilderness with no water, crying out to God, what are we going to do? We're going to die here. We're dying of thirst. And God tells Moses to go and speak to the rock. <clears throat> now, Moses, being the leader, did a very, very bad thing. Okay. So don't think for one minute that leaders are exempt. Just think for a moment, if God told you to go talk to a rock, has God ever told you to do something like that? Go talk to a rock. People would think you've got rocks in your head. Never mind. I remember, uh, don't let me forget where I'm at. Okay? Okay. But I remember one time we lived in Providence. And we lived uh, not too far from Linda's mom. There was a big, big park there. God told me, go down to the park. Just like he told many of the people in the Bible, Jeremiah, go down to the potter's house. Go here, go there. And he said to me, go down to the park. And so I went down to the park, and I was there, and guess what? Nobody was there. Nobody. Say nobody. Nobody. The park was empty. So I sat on the bench, and I said, Lord, after a while, I said, Lord, I'm here in the park. What, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to get up on that bench, and I want you to preach a salvation message. Now, <clears throat> one or two things will go through your mind. I'm not doing that. Because there's nobody here. That's rational thinking. But God said, no, you get up there on that bench and you preach a salvation message. And when you preach it, preach it as loud as you can. So what did I do? Did I say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to look foolish. I'm going to look stupid. Now think about it. I'm sure that there were people driving by seeing me standing on that bench, yelling at the top of my lungs to nobody. But there I was. I want you all to know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he came and he died for you and to forgive you of your sins and all you need to do is repent of your sins. So I went on and on. And after it was all done, I was home, and I sat there, and I said, Lord, that's going to be the dumbest thing I ever did. And this is what he told me. He said, could you see beyond those trees? I said, no. He said, how do you know I didn't want to share the gospel with somebody behind those trees in those homes? So wouldn't it be something... On that day when we're up in heaven, someone walks over to me and says, hey, you know when you stood up on that bench and you preached that message? I got saved. I gave my heart to Jesus. Come on, somebody. You don't know what God has. Just be obedient to his voice. It may look stupid. You may look foolish. 
But who knows the end results. He's able to bring supernatural above and beyond the natural water out of a rock. And as I said before, remember I said, remember where I'm at? Moses, it, you know, he wasn't too good at this. God told Moses, I want you to speak to the rock. Hello, rock. How you doing, rock? Speak to the rock. But no, he didn't speak to the rock. He took his staff and he struck the rock once and then twice. Water flowed from it, but he lost his blessing. Think about that. One, I mean, of all the things he did, separate the Red Sea, you know, God used him mightily, you know, brought the people out of Egypt, faced Pharaoh, all the things he did for God. And yet he just disobeyed in this one thing. God said, you cannot enter the promised land. And when the Israelites were ready to cross over, God took Moses up to the mountain. He told Joshua, I can't go. You know why. He said, but leave the people now. And then it says, Moses died. And Joshua took over and led the people through the promised land. Because he didn't obey God, God said, speak to the rock, and he smote the rock. Don't compromise when God wants to take you through that trial and that, that uh, place. Maybe it's a desert, maybe you're going through the wilderness, maybe you're going through a time, a, a personal hard time. Whatever it is, don't always run from that time because it's those times that are building your character and your, and, your, and your integrity of who you are. And God will use those things in your life. All you've got to do is be willing and obedient. And the Bible says what? You shall eat of the good of the land. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You shall eat of the good of the land. God has good things for you, great things for you to accomplish. You were born for such a time as this. Think about it. I don't care who you are, what age you are. You were born for such a time as this. God has you where he has you for such a time as this. If you will, submit your will to him. Follow him with all of your heart. Not look to all the things and the blessings of God. And follow God for the blessings. Follow God for the, for the, uh, for the uh, uh, materialistic things. But you follow God and obey his voice. The Bible says, you go, he'll lead you to that land flowing with milk and honey. Amen. And he will bring you through those things. And look at verse uh, 16 for a moment. I got just a couple of moments. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, and that he might prove thee to do thee what? Say it with me. To do thee good. Say it again, good. He's a good, good father. He's a good, good father. You can trust him. He wants to do good. He wants you to have the best. Now, that doesn't mean the, the you know, like the Cadillac and all. I'm not talking about material things. He wants you to have the best that he's provided for you spiritually. That he might prove thee to do thee Good, when? At the beginning of your wilderness experience? In the middle of your wilderness experience? When? At the end. At the latter end. So what you do now, what choices you make now in your life, 
is going to affect you the rest of your life. The people you associate with are going to define who you are, and that's who you will become in life. Who you associate with is going to define you in your character and in your integrity. Who you are hanging around with is going to define you. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. For what purpose? To do, thy, to do thee good at the end. Hallelujah. So you have the promise of a people. That's us. The Israelites too. Then you have a promise of a land. God's going to take us to heaven's glory. Come on, somebody. And then we have the promise that if we will hear his voice and obey him, and he proves us through these trials and tribulations, he will do good to us in the latter end. How many know that sometimes the end is better than the beginning? We can't see the whole in between, but God sees it. Amen? Can I get a good amen? Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand. <clears throat>